Welcome to Real Analysis. First, we know that the prerequisites for this course can be found in the Math Major Basics playlist or any introduction to logic, proofs, and set theory. Now, what should we expect from an introduction to Real Analysis? First, a main goal is to put calculus on a rigorous foundation. Typically, first calculus that we learn is very functional and applied, so there's a lot of rules and procedures. Also, there's a lot of hand-waving of the details. So for instance, we know continuity when we see it, but for a mathematician, we need to have a definition that quantifies it precisely. So that's gonna be a notion of Weierstrassian rigor. Okay, so that's proving things all the way down to the foundations. Now, for this, we need to learn how to do estimation proofs. Okay, so you may have heard of delta epsilon proofs, these typically involve a lot of inequalities. So if you've had a course in abstract algebra, okay, the proofs there are gonna be very different from the type of proofs we do in analysis. Okay, so here, estimation is gonna be our main philosophy. Now, from estimation, okay, there's an idea of nearness that comes out of that, which leads to topologies and metric spaces. With that, we can in turn take these functions of interest and treat them as points in a bigger space, and then that leads to an even bigger and more useful theory. Okay, but that's the advanced stuff. Now, for this segment, okay, we go back to square one. Okay, we'll take a look at the real numbers. So nothing heavy here, we just wanna play around with some ideas. Now, what are the real numbers? Well, sometime in your education, the real numbers are just handed to you. Okay, so you're just given the real number line. Now some things that show up in the real number line, we have the integers. Okay, so we have whole numbers, zero, all their negatives. From the integers, we can form the rational numbers. So here we take all quotients, we make sure we don't divide by zero. Now, in the real world, okay, the rational numbers are enough. So if I'm an engineer, or if I'm working with a calculator or computer, it never returns Okay, numbers that go on forever. Okay, so not only are we just using rational numbers there, we're using rational numbers that terminate. Now, turns out if we just stick to rational numbers, there are a lot of intuitive notions that we're gonna lose because the rational numbers are not what we call complete. So that leads us to the real number line. Real number line is to throw in all these other numbers that we call irrational numbers. So one thing we wanna focus on is a step going from two to three. So how do I get the real numbers from the rational numbers? Taking the reals as given, we can first compare the cardinality of the rational and irrational numbers. Recall, the rationals form a countable subset of the reals. So up here, I could put the rationals in an ordered list each element can be labeled with a distinct natural number. On the other hand, we've seen using a diagonalization argument that the reals are an uncountable set. So that means the irrationals are also uncountable since we're just discarding a countable subset. Now, that means on the real line, the rationals are vastly outnumbered by the irrational numbers. What makes real analysis work is that the rationals are evenly distributed throughout the reals. Now, how do I make sense of that statement? First we note, any real number can be estimated by rational numbers. So what I mean by this, if I have x a real number, I could find a sequence of rational numbers that converges to x. For instance, if we take x times 10 to the n and apply the floor function, okay, so that drops the decimal part, then we divide by 10 to the n. For instance, for square root of two, that'll give the sequence one, 1 1.4, 1.41, 1.414. At each step, I'm just adding another decimal place. Now, to make this rigorous, okay, we first need a construction of the real numbers, and then I need a notion of convergence of a sequence. So there's still something to show here. Another way to see how the rationals are distributed Okay, we have that every interval contains infinitely many rational numbers. Now, the game that we're gonna play here, okay, so every semester I get asked about 
what's the number next to zero? Now, the response is, well, you tell me what you think the number next to zero is, we'll call that x, and then we note if I take x over two, that's a number that's closer to zero. Now, if you wanna change your guess, then I'll just go to x over four, and so on and so on. So there's no number next to zero. Okay, let's go with that idea. So the first step is, okay, proposition, between any two rational numbers is another rational number. Now, this is straightforward. If I have m over n less than p over q, okay, rational numbers, well, I'll just take the midpoint. So that's given by the formula over here. And this is clearly another rational number. So for instance, if I take 1 third, 1 half, the midpoint is 5 over 12, and that's definitely rational slightly more complicated to show, between any two real numbers is also a rational number. To see this, we choose real numbers a and b with a strictly less than b. Okay, the picture looks like this. We argue based on the distance between a and b. Now, if that distance is strictly bigger than one, what can we say? Well, consider the integers. To get the positive integers, I start at zero and continually increment up by one, for the negative integers, we start zero and continually decrement by one. Now that means the gap between any two successive integers has length precisely one. So if I have an interval whose length is strictly bigger than one, then that interval has to contain some integer. And that's gonna be the rational number that we're looking for. For the case where the distance is less than or equal to one, it's gonna be the same idea, except instead of adding or subtracting one off of zero continually, we now add or subtract one over n for some fixed positive integer n. To find that n, we appeal to the Archimedean property of the reals. We'll be more precise about this later on, but for here, this just means we take our distance, b minus a. I can add that to itself continually until we get a number that's strictly bigger than one. So if I take our b minus a and keep adding it to itself, eventually, if one's here, this is gonna go past one. Now, how do I make use of that? Well, you'll note, this is the same as saying the distance between n a and n b, strictly bigger than one. So we can use our first part to say that there's an integer between n a and n b. Now, if we divide through here by n, okay, n's positive, so it doesn't change the inequality directions, we wind up with the rational number between a and b that we're looking for. Let's recall our familiar picture of the rational sitting inside the reals. We start with the integers, then we'll add in the integer multiples of a half, of a third, of a fourth, and so on. At any stage, there are gonna be gaps between the rationals, but if we take all of these at once, the gaps are gonna disappear, and we'll just have holes at the irrational points. Now, a fancy way to say that is that the rationals are dense in the real numbers, and we'll want to show that the reals are the completion of the rationals with respect to absolute value. So, completion is just going to be the process that fills in the holes where we have irrational numbers. We need to show that there's nothing else. Now, if you feel like you're getting some intuition for the rationals and the reals, here's something that's a little counterintuitive, and we'll finish with this. Note, if I take the rationals, we have a countable subset of the real numbers. So we could put the rationals in an ordered list, each element labeled by a distinct natural number. So say Q1, Q2, Q3, and so on. Each QI will make the midpoint of an interval with length epsilon over two to the i. Epsilon is a small positive number. Okay, for concreteness sake, you could let epsilon be equal to a half. Now, we take these intervals, take their union, okay, I'll call that E, and by construction, the rationals are contained in E. If we take the total mass of E, okay, so we're gonna take the sum of all the lengths of the intervals in E. Okay, well, that's gonna give us a geometric series, has some epsilon, and we note if we're in the real line, these intervals might overlap, so we can say for sure that this total mass is gonna be less than or equal to epsilon. Now note, we're taking our rationals, and I could fit them inside of 
a subset of the reals, which has total mass less than or equal to epsilon for any epsilon that's bigger than zero. So if I drive epsilon down to zero, that means if I wanted to assign a mass to the rationals, that mass would have to be zero. So that would mean the rationals are a dense subset of the reals, but they have no mass. So they're like dust. They're everywhere, but they weigh nothing. 